That day, a phone shows up to my house. A Motorola Droid <laughs> Verizon phone. Right, not a watch. So, no, not a watch. A phone. So then... I would love to have seen uh, your reaction at uh, that I, specific so, moment. So That's so about what I... Listeners, and welcome to episode 74 of Bad Voltage. After a short hiatus, we are back and almost at full strength. We are missing one member of the group. Mr. Lunduke was not able to join us for this episode. Yep. But the three of us did get together, and what are we going to talk about? Well, one of the things we can talk about is Google+, Plus, which is um, kind of trending down, and you've got to wonder whether the big Google axe is going to fall on it. So we're going to ask... Who's using it currently? What happens if it goes away? And then we're going to have a review of the Moto 360 Sport by Jeremy, who is not just going to talk about this device and how well it works and, you know, if it's any good or not, but he's also going to delve into a both discouraging and rather amusing customer support experience. And inspired by a recent discussion between uh, Linus Torvalds and Greg Crow Hartman and Bradley Kuhn on the Linux Kernel mailing list, we're going to talk about when the correct time to start litigation around software licensing is. I am not entirely convinced it was amusing, but... <laughs> and now, <laughs> bad voltage. I'm a pretty enthusiastic Google Plus user, or at least I used to be. Um, mm. And at one point, it was Google's big new play to be the new Facebook, and everything was to do with it. And you hear tales from inside Google about how basically everything got subordinated to G+. But apart from one big redesign they did a while back, which a whole bunch of people avoided, <laughs> as far as I can tell, and didn't click the give me the redesign button... We've seen very little going into Google Plus from Google themselves. Um, so at Google I.O., they announced a couple of new things that, that are basically obviously going to replace Hangouts, right? Um, we're seeing little Google Plus going on. My question is, if it goes away, if Google kill it in the same way they've killed a bunch of other projects because they didn't have the take-up they wanted, is that a sad thing? Where do people like me who actually like it where do we go instead? What's good about it that isn't good about other places? And I'd be interested in your thoughts. I mean, um, Jeremy, you're not much of a Google Plus user, I don't think. And Jono used to be and has kind of tailed back since he, you know, got on Mac and presumably posts on App on there now. So, yeah. <laughs> pretty much exactly that. <laughs> but, but more interestingly, <laughs> what what's out there providing what it provides? It's it's a shame, really, isn't it? Because I think Google Plus is great, but like we've said this countless times before on the show, that a social network is really all about the people that you follow. And the thing that Google Plus has traditionally been great at is having the people that we get on well with, the people that we enjoy spending time with, posting interesting material. Like I find that the quality of the content that people post on Google Plus is just it's better. Like on Twitter, it feels like someone's just throwing some shit over the wall. On Facebook, it's so filled with noise. Whereas G plus doesn't have those issues. Uh, and right. you know, I'm not an Instagram or a Snapchat user, uh, because I'm not 12. Um, but it's Six, like, uh, 16. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's, um, it, it's a good question. Like what's going to happen when you, know, in my mind, there is no question that Google plus is going to go away. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's not even away. the, um, yes, it didn't take off and it was kind of limited to, like you said, the sort of people we like hanging out with, which I can, I can see Google saying, okay, that's not the market we were aiming for. We were aiming for Facebook's market and we didn't get it. So we're going to shut it down, but they didn't shut it down, but it's kind of abandoned and I can feel the enthusiasm for Google Plus and the number of stuff, the amount of stuff posted on it, and the viability of the stuff posted, on it, I can feel that slowly, gradually tailing off. So, yeah. if they killed it twelve months ago, gone. You know what? The Google Plus experiment, we tried it, it failed, it's over, dead. 
then all right. But it's kind of gradually tailing away, which gives us a chance to think, well, where will we go instead, rather than the mad scramble when Reader went away? So I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think they're iterating it away from being a social network and being more of a, a Google identity, for lack of a better word, right? So right, the, that's what the social well. network part of it, I, it, it's interesting to me because I agree with Jono that it's difficult to... I don't even consider Twitter a social network, right? It's if you like when I follow the NFL to follow the draft, Twitter is definitely the best place because it's very short, very quick. The updates are fast and furious. And if you're doing something like an NFL draft, that that's a great place to do it. And Facebook to me is almost all of the noise and almost none of the signal. And I think <laughs> G plus for me, and I think the, the interesting thing is technical people really have taken to, to Google plus. Yeah. I, I don't know of another, it's, I, to my knowledge, the second largest social network, even now, right? I, in theory, but I think that's because basically Google made every Google user be surreptitiously a G plus user in the same way that um, every YouTube user, in order to leave a YouTube comment, you had to get a Google plus account. Uh, and see, right? this so, so yes. So yes, technically it's got loads and loads and loads and loads of users, um, but not because that people are actually engaging with Google Plus. Right. But this, yeah. I think, gets way, to part of why it's not successful. Oh, did, did one of your phones trigger the OK Google thing from yep. us talking about Google? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there's, there, there's, 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 there's now a search on, on the screen of my phone. In, uh, there's now a Google search showing for be surreptitiously a G plus user. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. I thought you had it in the background. Brilliant. That's actually funny. So I, so I need to turn off the thing which automatically detects that when I say things. Otherwise, I'll play this back and then it'll do it again. Oh, my God. <laughs> if Brian was here right now, he would be freaking out yeah. about this. The microphone <laughs> listening to us. Yes, yes, he uh, most certainly would. <laughs> wow. So, uh, but I think yeah, part so of it is that they really they that. really botched the launch, right? I would say, and I don't think they ever really recovered. They they wanted it to be the next Facebook at a time where that's not what people wanted, right? And the the whole yeah. n- real names thing they really blew. The, the way they made YouTube they users use it, they really botched. I don't think that. anyone really gets circles. I was going to say circles. I, I actually really if circles implemented correctly, which I think they're pretty close to doing, I think should have been the differentiating feature, right? Because there's yeah. not one per- you're not one person you're you're kind of a certain persona at work you're a certain component persona maybe yeah. with one group of friends and sharing everything like you do on and facebook kind of has groups but they don't really work in a way that's intuitive or realistic so i think I, that I, should have been a differentiator I, that it wasn't i think that the reason why it didn't succeed was because of that early period and it was because the whole circles thing was too com- too confusing for people. Because yeah. in my mind, circles are a great idea, but they're designed for the kind of people who used to drag their email into folders, like people who are very organised about their email. Y- used uh, to, you know, would have all these all these folders <laughs> set up. I'm, oh, uh, oh, you still do that? <laughs> I, 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 I don't even think it, it's that. I, I think they're designed for the sort of people who want to be able to say, what I want is I want this circle, but excluding this circle. So basically people who, if you really pushed them, could probably explain the SQL query, which underlies the circles. But I'm fine with that. I don't mind a social network where I hang out with people who can do that, because I can do that, right? But I, Most I, I of my friends it, can do that. I'm fine but, with that. But, but, but I was going to say, like, the thing that struck me, I remember when first Google Google Plus first came out, and I just I was like, I really personally didn't understand the circles thing and how it works and all the rest of it. And they've kind of like that as just as people have used it, and you've got to know it. Like I think most people don't use the circles thing as much as as Google would have liked. But I think also to your point, Act, like the fact that it was more complicated or it was a you know it was more for a power user i think attracted a certain mindset yeah. of people but the other thing i was going to say part of the reason why i don't think google plus has taken off is is um you can't post to it automatically in the same way you can with twitter and facebook and stuff like that they, so for they, example they, buffer doesn't work they've it. not done the api at all people have begged them since day one to publish right. some kind of api for it and they basically just flat out refused And that has got a double-edged sword, because on one hand, it means that you basically lose the industry, 
Like yeah. all of the all the social media agencies and things like that can't use it because they can't post to it, and companies can't because companies are not going to post as in a dedicated fashion. Like even just speaking personally, I use Buffer to post a a, a specific thing each day of the week, um, and that goes to like Facebook and whatever else. But I often forget to post it to, to G plus. But then the second thing as well is that the, the, the other side of that sword is maybe part of the reason why there is better content on Google Plus is because it's not being populated with all that crap from people, auto, yes. or, you know, posted in an automated way. It, it, <laughs> in, in order to post something on Google Plus, you have to actively engage with Google Plus, yeah. Um, right. The, th- the thing I don't know is if I want to write something which is longer than a tweet, it goes to Google Plus because I haven't really got anywhere else. I want to put it on Facebook because a whole bunch of people I was at school with don't right. care. I mean, probably I could get, uh, you know, I could engage more huh, with Facebook and actually, you know, curate my Facebook experience rather than just hating it and not going anywhere near it. But what right. else is that? I mean, this is not what Instagram is for. It's not what Snapchat is for. I think that's what Medium what wanted to be. For. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But Medium is too full of people writing think pieces and stroking their beds in a, in a Silicon Valley cafe. So I can't be doing with it. Um, you know what? Stereotypes are unfair. <laughs> Apart from in this specific case. <laughs> uh, hang on, John. Oh, you're, you're in California and you've got a beard. Have you got a Medium account? I do have a Medium account. Uh, <laughs> there we I, go. Right. But, but I, I, yeah, I don't. That's, really that, that's terribly unfair. Um, the only uh, um, one other place potentially is Reddit. But the problem with Reddit mm. is obviously Redditors. Yeah, right. pretty 4chan. I have... Yeah, it's pretty 4chan. Yes, I agree with that entirely. That's I incredibly have, unfair to Reddit, I'm sorry. <laughs> it totally isn't, right? It just isn't. There are some great Reddits, subreddits, that are nothing like yeah, 4chan. Yeah, but at any moment, you've got no idea whether you're going to trip over the most appalling misogyny or whatever imaginable, or porn or whatever. So I'm like, there's, you know what? There's, no. There's not none of that much. in the Donald subreddit. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a suggestion, but this is going to sound a bit like a pitch, but it isn't because I'm not sure about it myself. I've been playing with a thing called Imzy. I-M-Z-Y. Right? And okay. as far as I can tell, their goal is to be a prettier Reddit. Right? So you like can vote. create, you can create, not like vote. <laughs> vote is the exact votes. opposite. Vote is all the people who think that Reddit isn't misogynistic enough. Right? <laughs> not I've vote. Never used vote. Um, and I've been, I've been having a bit of a, uh, having a bit of a play around with it. It's, and their idea is, you know, you've got communities and you post in them and so on. Um, the, it's still incredibly new and, it's changing that fast that they haven't published an API yet because they reckon it would change every two days. And it's really slow and annoying. Um, I mean, they, 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 they've now got native mobile clients for it, which they've published all of about four days ago or something. And I think you still have to show up in their, in their thread for the Android one and say, I'd like the Android one, and they send you an invite to the beta or something. Right? It's all really, really new. But it feels like it could be kind of interesting. If you can keep out the sort of people who make Reddit a terrible, worrying place to go, then I think there's a possibility it could become an interesting place. The other problem, uh, but the flip side of that is it could just become Elo, right? Which never took off and had the same sort of mentality around it. I think we're, I think we have a little bit too much hyperbole or hyperbole if you will um, about <laughs> I, I will not hyperbole <laughs> about about reddit reddit is all reddit is is a is a light shone into the human dynamic in the fact that some groups of humans are really cool and some groups of humans are not cool and there are some great subreddits on there where you have no misogyny and you have no racism and there are some awful bastards on there mm-hmm. you're going to get that anywhere reddit is there's, you know, we could talk for hours about whether it's good or bad in the way that it's set up. I think it's actually done pretty well, given how simplistic it is um, in actually moderating people. But anyway. I, I, I don't agree. Check that's, out that's, that's, that, that, that's a whole different segment. Yeah. And yes. Like I say, this is, is not a, a pitch for Imsy. I'm, I'm not sure myself whether I like it. <laughs> but I'd be interested in people's thoughts i mean it, it may end up so. being the place i go to if google plus goes away but kind of by default rather than by design so bringing it back to that question do you think given the fallout that they had from reader 
especially from the technical community, do you think Google can get rid of Google Plus? Because they're I, starting to get a reputation for axing a lot of products, and at some point people are going to just stop using new Google products because they ax old ones if they keep doing it. Yeah, they are. Um, I so agree. can they I, kill I, I, Google Plus? Um, they they may not officially kill it, but I think if they basically down tools on it, that's de facto killing it. This is like what Microsoft did to Internet Explorer, right? Um, it was it was it was doing well, and everyone was using it, and they just basically didn't touch it for five years. Um, I I agree. I, I think that what will happen is they'll basically put it into maintenance mode, and they won't actually yes. maintain it outside of making sure that it doesn't get owned. Um, and it'll just die a slow withering death and they don't really have an option. I mean, Google would be bonkers to shut it down for exactly the point you made. For PR reasons. Yeah. It would look really bad, but I mean, notifications still don't work right in it. They never have done. I can't be the only person this happens to. And every time I mention it on YouTube, a whole bunch of people go, yeah, man, this is terrible. Um, some engineers must have noticed this, but and it isn't fixed. It's just infuriating. Language, you ruined G Plus for me. I don't think I've ever told you this. <laughs> but you just, just in a whimsy one day posted something posted something on G Plus by saying, you know, like an almost every web app that you use, if you want to submit a text box, you can press what is it? Shift and control enter and enter. Control and enter. Yep. And I just intrinsically do that when I use anything else. That doesn't work on G Plus and it still do doesn't you know work what? on G Plus. It does now. In new in new G Plus, when you submit a comment, you can control enter to submit it. Really? Yep. Ever since I read you po- read that post, it irritates me every single it, it time. It irritates me forever and ever and ever, yeah. But, I mean, it, wow. it's entirely possible that G Plus is getting a whole bunch of small, you know, not, hooray, new version, but small incremental fixing happening to it, and I'm just not seeing any of it. But the impression yeah, I have is they did, uh, they did a kind of one big push, and I can imagine the meeting inside Google Towers going, well, okay, we're going to do this, and if it doesn't work, then the hell with it. I'd be interested to know, <laughs> given the fact that, I mean, it's no, it's no surprise that we think that it's designed or, or that it's it's used more by kind of more technical people or people who are interested in technology and gaming and whatever else. Um, I'd be curious to know what Google is seeing as the typical demographic, because in my yeah. mind, if 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 they do have like people who are interested in smartphones and gaming and Linux and open source and whatever else using it, it seems like it would make sense to not necessarily explicitly state that that's now what it's designed for, but just to make it more attractive to that demographic of people. Because those are the people who are going to be buying Android phones and whatever else. Right, here is the thing. You, in saying that, you're operating like it was 15 years ago. Because people who are interested in gaming and nerd stuff and things like that, we're the majority now. We're now in a world where if you didn't see the latest Avengers film, you're not cool anymore. It's not like it was when we were at school. Thoroughly, thoroughly disagree. Yeah, games, no, I disagree cost as well. more money to, games cost more money to make than Hollywood films and make more money than Hollywood films. That's only because I, Hollywood films accounting is a sham. Yeah. I, I don't agree with you. But, I you know, th- this is my point. Right? I, okay, I mean, even if you don't agree with that, it's a lot more mainstream than it was. So the point it, is, it, if you build something which appeals to gamers and people who like technology, right, that ought to be 45% of the population. And, it, and it is, Google Plus it, yeah. hasn't got that. It's got 0.45% of the it, population. It isn't, though. It isn't, though, because I, while technology is definitely, you know, seeped into everybody's lives, like most people have got smartphones and, and whatever else, um, at least in the West, uh, it's, you know, there's still like things like gaming, like the PS4 has sold God knows how many consoles, um, but it's still very much a specialist thing. Um, you don't, you don't have casual gamers buying PS4s. And I think there's a lot of specialty content, the kind of people who watch, you know, let's play Game streamers on YouTube. <laughs> for but example game of, game of thrones i wouldn't say is a nerd thing in the fact that they've just managed to create they've managed to create kind of like that 
Dungeons and Dragons style science fiction in a way that is interesting and consumable by the general public. It's about right? war in a made up fantasy continent. What more do right. you want? Right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the only people who are that that just there's because a bloke Game who can of do magic in it. Just right? because East Enders, it isn't. Just because <laughs> Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings and you know Captain America and stuff like that has become popular doesn't necessarily mean that now everybody is a nerd. I think what they've managed to do is to build TV shows and movies that are, are of interest to to the general public. In the same way that, like, years and years, in the 80s, if you did a movie like that, it would be so ridiculously nerdy and over That's the, the top. point, right? Yeah, th- 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 this is exactly the thing, that if you made it in the 80s, you get Hawk the Slayer, right? And right. only a few people will watch it, like E.G., us and that would be fine right but now you bring out something like game of thrones and it's the most popular program on television now to, you can either say right okay that means basically everyone's at least a little bit more of a nerd than they were or you can basically define nerd as being not the mainstream which to me is a bit no true scotsman i i think right. n- nerd culture is definitely bigger than it was i'm not saying that for a second what i'm saying is the kind of nerds that we see this is incredibly discriminating towards nerds uh, the kind of nerds that we see on google plus the kind of people who are posting about you know elementary and uh you know linux and open source and and posting walkthroughs of uh you know deus ex and stuff the, like that the witcher 3 and the new deus ex game and what have you which, I, I would which millions those, of people have played I, I would argue that that is more specialist content like yeah what would be interesting anyway. and i don't know how to find this out is yes there is a there is a big google plus community for people who do the sort of thing we do you know open source stuff linux right. that sort of thing but i wonder whether there are huge g plus communities for i don't know car mechanics or absolute right, right. or something and i don't know really how to find out but maybe Google Plus is still way more popular than we think it is. And even though it's tailing off among our demographic, doesn't mean it's tailing off in everybody's. It's a good point, because maybe, like, our demographic, we tend to move on to newer things quicker, right? Because we're nerds. Well, you're doctors, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll be curious to see how this all pans out. Um, again, this seems like a maybe a community conversation. Um, so, go to our G Plus group, <laughs> which... Uh, do either of you guys ever look at? Do we have a G Plus group? Like, Go to the uh, forum. We do. There's your or answer men- there, listeners. Or mention us on Google Plus, and we'll get into some discussions about it. If you mention right. us by name, we are summoned. Yeah, let's have, let's have a conversation about G Plus on Twitter, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and let us know what you think. I'm an avid runner, and while I've run with an Android phone and various apps for quite some time, I've been increasingly wanting an Android Wear device that would make my many Garmin-wearing running mates covetous. Enter the Moto 360 Sport, one of the first true Android GPS-enabled running smartwatches. Considering how much I liked the Moto 360 Gen 2, I was eagerly awaiting the 360 Sport, which was announced at the same time as the Gen 2 but had a later release date. The 45mm device comes with the same 1.37 inch display as the Gen 2, and that does include the flat tire for those wondering, but the AnyLite hybrid display makes it easily readable even in sunny conditions. The silicon strap comes in black, white, and flame orange, but as it's part of a unibody construction, it is not changeable. While many reviewers have found the strap to be a lint magnet, after over a month of use, I did not find that to be an issue. The device has an optical heart rate monitor, barometric altimeter, accelerometer, ambient light sensor, gyroscope, and a 300mAh battery. Like the Gen 2, it is IP67 dust and water resistant. Moving on to using the device, I found the construction to be solid and the watch is comfortable to wear even during longer runs. Most popular running apps have Android Wear support at this point, although I found most have at least one annoying issue that needs to be addressed before being a true competitor to a dedicated running watch. And I use Strava and Endemondo regularly, but also pretty extensively tested most apps including Runtastic, Runkeeper, MapMyRun, and Ghost Racer. The platform itself also seems to be a little bit temperamental, which has resulted in me missing out on data points for a couple of interesting runs. 
for example, the data for my Boilermaker run, which is a 15k, does show over an hour of activity, but a distance traveled of zero, and that particular issue seems to be related to a known bug with Endemano and Wear devices that have GPS, but I did run into a couple other issues as well. On the note of GPS, I found it to be roughly as accurate as my phone's GPS, although getting a lock did take substantially longer at times. It's a little less useful than I had initially hoped though, as using the GPS and the active display means the battery life isn't sufficient for longer runs. The device does have 4GB of internal memory which you can play music from, although I did not test that feature. I found the heart rate monitor to be accurate enough to be useful, and it is a nice addition to your running metrics. So, what's the bad voltage verdict? Although the Moto 360 Sport lacks more advanced features such as Cadence or VO2 Max, it is a very capable device. For shorter runs, it will allow you to leave your smart home at home, and for longer runs, just being able to see stats during your run and being able to move your phone from your armband to a pouch really does make for a more enjoyable experience. Additionally, the display is absolutely top notch. And with the original MSRP of $299 already being marked down to $199, it's a device I would have tacitly recommended now, and as the platform matures I could see that turning into a much stronger recommendation, and I can say I was definitely looking forward to the second iteration of the device. At least I was until I encountered Motorola support. So like I said, before we get to that uh, interesting customer service experience, <laughs> I figured I would see if you guys had any questions about the actual device. Well, a couple. I mean, bear in mind that you've basically owned every smartwatch there's ever been, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yes, yes, you but have. A couple, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you say... Um, Ignore their customer support issues. If Motorola were a really nice company and mm. you went out shopping again, would you buy this? So it is still one of the only true running watches that is also Android Wear. I, I yeah. think once Android Wear 2 comes out and some of the app support improves a little bit, yes, I think it will be a, a device that I would recommend and that I would purchase again it's still nowhere near unfortunately a garmin uh, well this is, um, is what there I was were hoping two for. questions i had around that the first one is that yeah garmin are better at the running less good at the watch right. but why would you recommend this over some kind of high-end fitbit thing which isn't a watch was, and he's just guess the same running I was going to ask the same question, like, for example, the Blaze, which came, the Fitbit Blaze, which came out recently, or the Surge, which has been around for a while, which have most of this kind of same features. Why would you choose the uh, the Moto? So I don't think I can answer that question intelligently because I have not ever used a Fitbit device of any kind, so I have no idea what right. their actual capabilities are. The thing that's nice about this for me is I am already in the Android ecosystem from a running perspective. Right, I already right. used Endemondo when I bike. I already used Strava. So before, let's say I was going on a run, I had an armband with my phone in it. I'd have to take it off my arm, open up Endemondo, start the run, which for a training run is fine. If you're at an organized 15K like the Boilermaker and there's 15,000 people there and I'm quick but not super quick, so I'm lined up in the fourth bin, I have to start jogging for the quarter of a mile that it takes to get to the start line, then take my armband on ar around a lot of people while I'm already running, start it near the start line, put it back on. It really is a pain, right? So with the watch, I keep an Endemondo. I keep my existing metrics. I keep a program that I like and use and pay for. But when I cross the start line, I just press a button on my watch and it works. The, and the, the same idea, thing when I stop, as opposed yeah. to stopping and taking off my armband and unlocking my phone and getting into Endemondo, I just press stop. And while I'm running, I can just look at it and say, okay, I'm six miles into the run. Here's my current pace. Here's my heart rate. Here's all the information. So it's right there on your wrist, which that part of it really is a step up. And the right, screen right. is really I, I good. Think, like you can, the scun, you can see the display yeah. in broad daylight very well, which I, I will give them. I think that's the distinction between a smartwatch and something like a Fitbit, whatever. Um, fitness dedicated companies have the opportunity to provide a decent user experience to you. Whereas if you buy a Fitbit thing, you get Fitbit's user experience, like it or not. So if they didn't provide you with a convenient button to start the race and tie into data, then unlucky, you haven't got one. 
I would say you get that with most devices, though, right? I mean, Fitbit are particularly closed in this area. There's no doubt about it. Like, they don't, you can't get Fitbit data out into things like Google Fit, for example. Um, okay. But you can, you know, to be fair to Fitbit, they actually have a pretty decent user experience. But I'd say you get that with any product. Like, the way in which you initiate the features on the phone, uh, on, the, on the device itself, will be somewhat specific in a way to to the device that you've got obviously the exception with the with the with the wear devices is that you can you can run these different things on there but if you've got a decent experience on something like a fitbit then whatever my uh, outsiders uh, kind of perspective is that the fitbit is for people who aren't necessarily athletic but want a something to monitor their wellness so they yeah, get their steps in and they get stuff like that. I don't know of any runners or cyclists that use it. Ah, uh, so this is this is an athletics device like the like the Garmin is. And for right, no, this is definitely normal people pitched as a running fit. watch. Right, okay. Where the Garmin's um, more of a active watch because it does biking and you can yeah, do a burpee cycling. in the Garmin and it will pick up that you're doing a burpee. The Motorola watch at this point in its life cycle is more of a running watch with some of the other fitness tracking stuff coming soon. Right. Yeah. Brief. One more brief technical question. Sure. Um, you mentioned battery life. Now, I think the idea of a watch you have to charge every day is woeful and stupid to begin with. But you said that the battery life doesn't even last a run, let alone a day. So if you keep the active screen on and so the d- device works one of two ways. If you go out without a phone and want to track via GPS, it actually has GPS in the device. If right. you're running with your phone anyway, which I do because I stream music from the phone, not from the watch, then it uses your phone's GPS. With the f- Using it that way, I could probably make it through a marathon without a problem. If you use the watch's GPS, I don't even think I could make it through a half marathon. It would be really close. The, the battery life when you're using the GPS is pretty it's like poor. A marathon's what, four hours? Oh. In that range, yep. Yeah. My, my, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether that's, you know, Jeremy Pace or world record Pace, but it's of that kind of order, right? Yes. Um, but that's that's nothing. I mean, that suggests that if you have the watch on and you run a race and then you want to just stand about and talk to people afterwards and have a drink of orange juice, you won't know what time it is because your watch has run out of power. That's, well, that's ridiculous. For, for those kind of runs, I would still say at this point you have to run with the phone. Right. Okay. And then if you do that, or, or it's wear fine. two watches, which is idiotic. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the things that I actually have been quite impressed with with the Fitbits is the battery life. Battery life's amazing, decent. but you it doesn't have a GPS, away. correct? Like you can't track. Uh, right? The higher end ones do, like the Surge does and oh, okay. the Blaze does, I believe. I don't know what the, the what the battery life is like for those. Okay. The problem with the Fitbits, as I mentioned in the review that I did a while back, is the build quality is pretty crappy. Yeah. Um, whereas it sounds like with a Moto that it's pretty. It was pretty good. Pretty yes. Solid. So a deft so. segue there from the things that Moto have done well, <laughs> like build yes. quality, onto what happens if you get one and you wish you didn't. <laughs> so I, I know we we're trying to keep this short, and I'm going to try and power through this. But this was honestly, in retrospect, probably the worst customer experience I've ever had from any company ever which is a pretty low <laughs> bar these days. So, Are you, about, a, uh, are you a Comcast customer? <laughs> <laughs> I, we have Time Warner in the Northeast. Oh, so, my God. Yeah, and the worst not, not oh, any better, it. yes. Uh, so about a month and a half after I got this, I was on a run, and it rebooted, shut off, and wouldn't turn back on. And I did a bunch of research online, and it seemed to be a problem that happened to a few people. There's a couple ways that you could try to solve it. It worked once. It did the exact thing same thing again, and then wouldn't turn on. So I went online to the portal, because I don't like calling if I can avoid it, tried to uh, get an RMA number, and their system was down. Tried that for a few days, system continued to be down, so I called. Turns out they couldn't RMA it either, their system was down, so they opened an internal ticket, which (laughs) took them over a week to solve. So we're already a week into this, and I can't even get an RMA from them. Then so, so to be clear, this is not a replacement device. You're just trying to get a number so you can send it back to them. Correct. So it took them over a week just for that. And that's the best part of the experience for a long time. <laughs> so from there, they said, okay, we finally got this ticket uh, resolved internally. We can open up a thing for $25. We'll send you a device ahead of time. And if you don't send it back, you know, we'll charge your card. Or you can send yours in. We'll take a look at it and either repair it or replace it. But that could take a few weeks. And, I, you know, at this point, it had been so long, I said, you know what, I think you should waive the 25 bucks. just send me a watch. They finally agreed and said, okay. 
So I gave them a credit card number, uh, which they said was declined, which I called my credit card company later and it was never declined. They didn't even try. Then they told me to go back online, but the serial number at this point wouldn't work. So they told me to use a fake serial number, (laughs) which seems like a weird thing to do. That one went through. They confirmed it went through. Called, they sent me an email the next day, credit card was declined. So I used a different card that has a zero balance that I never used. They assured me this one went through. Two days later, it was, we canceled that credit card was declined. The odd one with the third one, when I got the credit card decline note from them, I also got a FedEx shipping number that said they shipped me something. <laughs> <laughs> so I confirmed with them that nothing was shipped, that I wasn't being charged. They said, yes, everything's being declined. I log into my credit card company. They have two different pending charges for Motorola. That day, a phone shows up to my house. A Motorola Droid <laughs> Verizon phone. Right, not a watch. So, no, not a watch. A phone. So then, I would love to have seen uh, your reaction at uh, that I, specific so, moment. So That's about what I this, lost. At this it, point, you've paid for two watches. You've got naught watches. Well, no. So I called the credit card company. And got one phone, <laughs> and they said that they they were they never went through. They gave me the amounts and the dates and a you know a number associated with each so i get back to Motorola and they said no we didn't ship you anything despite me having a tracking number that's delivered to my house and a phone <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't see either of the billings on their end <laughs> so that that's i don't know how they cannot know they shipped you a phone not see anything in their system and then try to bill you twice it's that's how ridiculous the experience was. I finally got a hold of someone. Fr- I kind of posted about it and blogged about it and tweeted about it. Someone from the office of the CEO got back to me. And st- it's still, even after that, that was a much more competent person because the first level of tech support at Motorola was I've never experienced that bad of just them not even understanding their own internal systems and their own internal systems either being down or that bad. Where the yeah. other support, they were definitely competent and definitely trying to help. They still didn't understand how I got a phone, and they never did explain that. But I made it clear <laughs> at that point, like, I don't even care about me getting the watch now. I would, like, I need some kind of assurance that they're going to look into this and ensure it doesn't happen again. Because I've recommended the last Motorola watch to quite a few people that have purchased it. And if one of them has to go through this, I will be mortified that I recommended this device. <laughs> You're like, okay, Motorola, baby. Well, we're now in a situation where in my head, there is the Motorola logo with a big red circle and a line through it. And that's like my yes. entire experience. <laughs> <Correct>. with <you. laughs> so in all said and done, they did get me a new device and they have assured me at multiple levels. And, and I think at the highest level of support that they've done a deep uh, root cause analysis on this and have uh, unsurprisingly found some areas where their support can be improved and they have assured me that they are going to do so. So I I do have a new Motorola 360 Sport that has worked since and it's working fine. (laughs) They have assured me that they're going to fix the issues at this point. I... You know, it puts me in a tough spot because I don't know that I recommend a Motorola device for a long time, but I don't even know how I would know that this issue is fixed because I hope none of my devices break. This was um, when I got the OnePlus X, my phone. Um, a whole bunch of people said, man, their customer support's terrible. Don't buy anything from them. Um, and that came from enough different areas that I thought, huh, okay, maybe that's a problem. But in the end, I just went for it, crossed my fingers and thought, I hope nothing goes wrong. And so far, touch wood, nothing has. Because right. I've bought Motorola stuff before, and it's been fine because I haven't had to talk to them about it. Right. So, given that you've now been through this miserable experience, do you think it's still worth going with Motorola and just hoping nothing goes wrong? Or is the risk that something might go wrong and pitch you into this pit of misery now so terrible that no one should ever buy Motorola stuff ever, ever again? I think that's the part that's been most frustrating for me because the... 360 Gen 2 smartwatch, I still think is probably the best Android Wear smartwatch you can get. I mean, the Huawei's also very nice, but it's one of the best. And I think the you know 360 Sport is really the only viable running Android Wear watch that I've seen that has GPS and has some of the other stuff. So it's in a weird place where the devices itself seem very well built, the quality's there, the, the fit and finish is there, the engineering seems there, but the support was so so bad and so, and so <laughs> systemically bad. It's not like I got a singular bad support rep, which happens with any company. It's that their systems will bill you, not know they sent you a device, to charge you twice, and they still can't see it a week later. I, that's so bad systemically that I, I don't know. I, I'm it's, not. I'm it, still not sure exactly what to yeah. think. 
how how the dots could be that unjoined up. Yes. <laughs> um, exactly. On the other hand, presumably your yak is now completely bald. <laughs> so I'm sure that's good. <laughs> Uh, if someone started listening at that particular moment, that would be a bit weird. That, that uh, would be a bit weird. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, wow. I think, so I know the segment's getting a little long. I think if listeners are interested, I would be curious to know, and, and if there's enough listener interest, we could do a whole segment on why isn't customer support more of a differentiator today? Do, do people just really, in this day and age, want the cheapest device and don't care? Or would a a quality, consistent customer service experience be something that people were willing to be would be willing to pay more for. I'm, I'm curious you, about you know that. What's, you know what's interesting about that as well is, from my experience, the, the, there's obviously, usually there's more terrible customer support experiences than, than decent ones. But the impression I get is that when companies really are intentional about really good support, um, it leaves a much stronger kind of commitment to that company than they would ever have imagined. And the classic example yeah. to me here is Amazon. Amazon customer support is flawless from my experience. Like I've had various, we buy everything from Amazon and Costco and, you know, we'll buy like things and they'll arrive and they won't be right or they'll be broken. Very occasionally that happens. But when we get on the line to them, they will go out of their way to make sure that it's, that it's, that it's, that it's done well. And it's not just about like solving the problem. It's like going a step beyond that. And then that turns that bad experience into a good one. So I'd be Zap- curious. To know Zappos is the, is the canonical example of this. Yeah. I've yeah. always had next level customer series support yeah, yeah. from but Zappos. That, that's and and like, I use them the quite thing a bit we because do of it. Is customer support. You know, we're basically yeah. a shoe shop. We do customer support. That's our thing. And they're brilliant at it. And it turns everyone who buys anything off you and has something go wrong into an evangelist for your company. Yeah. Yes. A few weeks ago, there was a bit of a spat kicked off on the internet uh, in which Linus Torvalds, famed author of the Linux kernel, responded to a post from Greg K.H., who's uh, a fairly senior subsystem maintainer in Linux as well, um, and basically had a massive rant. uh, Linus had a massive rant about when is the right time to litigate or when should you litigate against uh, GPL violations. So it's a little bit of a backstory. Uh, you know, lots and lots of companies invest in the Linux kernel. Uh, and from time to time, there are companies who don't sit within the uh, requirements of the GPL. And the Software Com- Freedom Conservancy, who we've had on the show before, who's headed up by Bradley Kuhn and Karen Sandler, um, they have a GPL violations uh, initiative where they basically go after companies and they try to solve these problems with the most notable recently being VMware. And Linus's, uh, you know, I'm obviously paraphrasing here, but Linus's view was when you call the lawyers in, um, it, it, it makes companies nervous. So what happens is the companies get really nervous uh, because there's some kind of litigation going on and then they stop contributing. So Linus's view was that the, the legal option is the nuclear option. You should only ever use it as a nuclear option. And he had a particularly personal rant against Bradley Kuhn about, about his approach to things, because Bradley is obviously very passionate about this particular subject. So I'm not sure if we really want to get so much into the Linus versus Bradley thing. I think that's already been talked about. But the question is, when is the right time to litigate? Like, how do you make sure that you're protecting the GPL because it's important or another open source license? But you're also not making companies nervous by initiating too much legal action. How do you get that balance right? What do you guys think? I think, first of all, calling it a spat is a bit small. I think I'd, uh, I think I'd call it a fracas. I'd maybe even go so far as to call it a brouhaha. <laughs> because- <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys, either of you, read the entire thread? I read the entire thread. I, I, I read the entire thread at the point at which I read it. It's possible it went on for another 450 messages beyond that. Yeah, so for was, those of you fair. who like have not read the entire thread, it is staggeringly long. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be fair as well, it seems like towards the end, Linus kind of came around and said, maybe I had a bit of an overreaction to I, I, this. I think, like, I think the, the pitch, the thing that he was going for, um, is the idea that... Reaching for legal stuff 
going to people and saying, look, you're in violation, fix it, is not as good as going to people and saying, look, we want to work with you, we want to make it happen, fine, you're getting away with this stuff at the moment, but if we work with you over time and we're welcoming and friendly and everything, eventually you show up and, you know, you become part of the Kernel Development Community. But if we go in with the lawyers, even if we, in quotes, win, it just means the next time that company brings out a product, they'll just go, find whatever, dude, and ship it with BSD or VXWorks or something and not care. It makes them never want to join the community ever. Um, yeah. And I think his accusation against Bradley, I don't want to get into the Linux versus Bradley thing, but the accusation was that it was... Bradley reaches for lawyer stuff because he's he hangs out with lawyers, basically. Right, right. In the same way that, you know, if you're buying a house, right, p- picking an example out of nowhere and nothing to do with my personal life, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the solicitors involved tend to be very much, um, I'm going to defend my client's rights, and if that means screwing the other person, whatever, doesn't matter. And half the time, they create the problems by being this bullish about it. Anyone who's right. been through a divorce yeah. will understand this as well. And it's right, that right. kind of attitude that they want to avoid, I think. The, the one thing that I thought yeah, was interesting, I mean, right, is I think that in the end, at least my assessment of kind of the conclusions is that... <laughs> I think everyone in the community agrees, there's pretty good consensus at least, that lawsuits lawsuit should only be used as a last resort. I think where there's pretty significant disagreements is where and when is last resort. That to me seemed, right, even, right, even Linus exactly. in the end said there are times where you probably have to litigate. But I think his is the very end nuclear option. And I think some people are significantly before that. So I think that's, nailing that down I think is where it's going to be interesting to get see if you can get any bit of consensus. But I, I don't think... I think part of the difference is, right, if you're Linus or you're Greg, you value Linux over the GPL, right? And if you're Bradley, yeah. you value the GPL over Linux. And I, I right. because they're coming from those two different perspectives, I don't know how you get them to, to reach a middle ground that both are going to be happy with it. That was... The thing... The that was, th- oh, God. I was just going to say real quick, that was actually... I wrote a blog post about this when this was going on, that that was kind of my takeaway, too, was that... Um, the, just the priorities are drawn in, in slightly different areas. Uh, like Linus has always been doggedly pragmatic about about the GPL and he's been quite critical towards RMS and the Free Software Foundation about their approach with the GPL. Linus sees it as, you know, code first, licensing second. And, you know, anyone, like, I, I have a lot of respect for Bradley. You know, I support Conservancy. I think he can be a bit bullish from time to time in, in, in his approach, but I think Linus can be a bit bullish from time to time in his approach. But Bradley is very clearly someone who is very much focused on the ethics of, of the license. Like yes. He sees that as as important, if not more important, than the license. And that was the thing that struck me, was that these two guys are basically they're basically in agreement with each other. They don't want litigation to happen too early, but it was like two people talk, kind of cross talking past each other a little bit. Yeah. The thing, um, the parallel I've drawn in my head is it feels to me like SFLC are doing legal stuff. And what Linus and Greg and the, that side of the Colonel team are doing is kind of like nation state diplomacy. Right. Um, so if you see a, if there's a country who are doing something wrong, there'll be a whole bunch of people who are saying, well, it's simple. It's obvious. Right. What they're doing is a war crime or something. So we just arrest the top guy and drag him to the Hague. But then there'll right. be a bunch of people. And I admit and my source for a lot of this is, you know, the West Wing or whatever. So <laughs> <laughs> as it should be. But you see a lot of kind of negotiation stuff where diplomacy isn't just about going well you're wrong and you're wrong and therefore you must be seen to be wrong and so on it's more about what we want is the end goal and so if we get there by softly softly catchy monkey then that's okay and that right. feels to me like what linus what greg the kind of the the suggestion they're pitching is you can't deal with this like the police dealing with a speeding motorist you have to deal with this like the u.s dealing with iran right it's about sit down and discussions and easing someone into the right way and moving the overton window 
and that sort of thing, rather than stand up and go, look, we're right and you're wrong and we're going to prove that, which they could do, but, you know, well, long-term you know, bad effects. That's the feeling I have, the analogy. I think part of that, though, is right. Head. I think from the SFC's perspective, and I'm not trying to put words in their mouth, this is just my interpretation of it, is Linux, the kernel, can probably do things that almost no other project can do. Right. So when they want to make a point with the GPL, I think they look at Linux as a good way to do so because th- there's very few projects that have that huge of a developer community, that big of corporate sponsorships. It's really almost irreplaceable at this point. So if they can prove it with that, then a lot of smaller projects that can't do the kind of things the Linux kernel can do, then they're happy to use the Linux kernel as that leverage where I think people associated with the Linux kernel don't want it to be used as that leverage. Yes. They, 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 um, they don't uh, care about the, that the, point. They don't, yeah. they don't need that point. Well, the, 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 the impression I, I have, like, though, is that um, the, the Linux kernel development team don't um, see their primary goal as building the Linux kernel not to be used as a tool to make people understand the GPL. Right. Um, right. This, this, is, this is the um, busy box was exactly the same thing. It was basically... This exists, and everyone's using it because it's better than the alternatives. And so we must use it as a crowbar with which to force people into using the GPL. In the same way Mozilla used um, the fact that their code was GPL, and the same way the GCC was the best compiler that everyone can use. And in almost all of those situations, eventually everyone went, you know what, rather than doing this, screw you, we're going to build our own things. There was alternatives to BusyBox built, Apple forked KHTML rather than Gecko. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, LLV, well, the- LLVM and Clang came up instead of GCC because if you if you hammer people too hard with the GPL thing, instead of instead the theory is you go well it's irreplaceable, but actually probably actually not irreplaceable. In the end, we all end up worse off because of it. This I wonder is is this behind Google's recent creation of Fuchsia, an operating system kernel. Well, the thing is as well that I think kind of feeds into this is a big chunk of this is just the personalities at play is, um, you know, Bradley is an example. You know, he is well known for being, like I said earlier on, pretty bullish about his perspectives and his opinions. Like when you see him speak at conferences, he's very opinionated, he's very focused. And it could be easy to assume because he's bullish and because he's focused that there isn't any nuance in the approach that the software freedom conservancy takes right so one of the uh, one of the the defenses of, of from bradley and, and others was that no we, we we don't just go running for the nuclear button we actually there is already a lot of conversation a lot of you're just you not know, seeing it negotiation you're yeah. just not seeing it but and part of it struck me was that maybe because bradley has that kind of personality and i disagree a lot with bradley on things but i really respect the work that he does and I think it's important it, it's easy to kind of jump to conclusions in the same way that it's easy to jump to conclusions with Linus the fact that he's pretty bullish on the on, on LKML that, that there isn't any nuance there or that he's got no tolerance for people um, but the other thing as well about the GPL thing is there are just not that many GPL projects coming out these days as well no. like the GPL no, not. is not winning as an open source license right. um, and, and I and, honestly think that's because of this kind of issue. The people just think, you know what? Right. I can't be bothered to deal with that. I'm just going to step away. So it's this. It's a negative externality, right? Um, every time someone even says the word GPL violation lawsuit, says the phrase GPL violation lawsuit, it it, it, it a very small amount decreases the viability of the GPL in general because the only time any, anyone ever hears the phrase GPL is in the context of maybe there should be a lawsuit about this. You think, well, we don't want a lawsuit. We don't want to get into hassle. We don't want to even want to think about this. We'll just do MIT or something. I, I, I was blown away a few years ago uh, when I was at this, this event and it was basically full of like C-level executives from open source companies. And there was an exercise which was if you were to create a new product and it was to be open source, what would you license it license under? Not a single company said the GPL. And and I, I'd kind of heard this in passing, but it was really stark. Like, everybody was Apache. And, and one of the major reasons was because of this, was that if you basically sign up to the GPL, and this is how one person said it, and, like, I'm paraphrasing, you're basically inviting the crazies into your company. And that's not a fair way of putting it. 
but the point still stands. <laughs> I think, too, so, aside from companies, if you look at, and maybe this is just my interpretation of where things are heading, but I think when, not that we're aging, but when I got involved in this open source community, I think there was a smaller number of developers in the community in general, and those developers cared about the moral aspects of the GPL. They cared about the ethical aspects of the GPL. The newer developers right, right. coming online do not care. They go to not, GitHub, they yeah. pick a license, they pick the easiest one, which tends to be Apache, MIT, or BSD, and that's it. They don't, the the rights that the GPL gives you, don't. they just don't care about it with at all. Yeah. Right. And I think from if you look at the commercial side, as Jono said, they do care, but they care about it in a way that they don't want to use the GPL. So I think yeah. from both directions, the GPL is kind of losing mind share at this point. If, if you spend 30 years telling people the most important thing about the GPL is the ethics, the open source movement comes up and says, actually, you know, the, the important thing is what it does for your company and your business and um, how it feeds back into your bottom line. And you say, no, nope, that's not what it is. It's about the ethics. Then by definition, you're suggesting that the main reason people People should choose the GPL is because they care about GPL ethics, and someone running a company doesn't. Right? I mean, that's yeah. not necessarily to say that they're correct to not care about that. But the Free Software Foundation have not done that good a job at actually convincing people to follow their ethical stance, as evidenced by the fact that they're on the fringe. So, <laughs> so if you tell people if you're picking the GPL for some reason other than ethics, then you're wrong. Then if you say, well, I don't follow the ethics of the GPL, then I'm not going to pick the GPL. I'm not going to pick it by default. The only reason I'd pick it is because the ethics. I don't have the ethics, so I'm Apache. Goodbye. Right. Step out of the GPL ecosystem. Right, right, right. So when I mean, if all right, let's go around the table. Like, if when do you guys think? What criteria would you? I know you can't boil this down into like a recipe. But just bringing this into a bit of a conclusion, like if you were to basically say, when is the time that you press the nuclear button? When is the time that you bring the lawyers in and the, that you face the risk that the legal action may put off other companies, even, not just the company you're dealing with, but also other companies who are observing it? Under what conditions do you guys feel is the right time to do that? I think you have to add one thing, in my opinion, to that, too, is you have to pick the right times, because if you pick the wrong times and you lose, there could be massive fallout from that, because then you're going to have case right. law on the wrong side of what you want. But I mean, f f right. me, I think I would always be someone that would say you should try the back channel first. And like I said, especially with something like the Linux kernel, and if you're dealing with a big player like IBM, that they're a very large company that's going to act fairly rationally and predictably. And I think in those kinds of situations, back channel works. There, It's been, I think, made clear that some companies do not care. And especially if you make a very short-lived device that you're not going to even need. Right, right, One of the things about the GPL and getting your code upstream is that it really does benefit you in the long run because you don't have to maintain your own tree, which is really difficult with something like the kernel. If you have these companies that are making IoT devices that they're just going to blast out in large amounts once, they don't care about GPL violations because they're not going to even update device where keeping their own fork would matter. So in cases like that, I, I think at some point you do need to sue. It should definitely be, I, I think, a, a very last resort. Uh, but without the option of a lawsuit, right, it's difficult to negotiate with players of that nature. Right. What do you think, Stuart? Hmm. Um, there are a couple of things here. The first one is that there is a distinction between actually suing and a credible threat that you're going to sue. This is back to the diplomacy thing, right? Because basically, my opinion is actually having a lawsuit, except in very, very, very rare occurrences, just doesn't do any good. Right, But if you tell people that you think that, then you can no longer credibly threaten it because they know you're lying. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the worry here is not about the actual, the actual litigation. It's about diffusing your threat, right? Which, which is why right. I say it's diplomacy. Um, there are a few occasions when I do think it's worth it. If the party on the other side has no interest in the technology whatsoever, they only exist as a legal entity, then you can only oppose them in the legal sphere. The obvious example here is SCO, right? Um, right. At that point, there, there were a bunch of patents owned by essentially some kind of patent troll-style company. Um, and 
It's not like you can pursue them and say, uh, you know, you you do the back channel thing and say, no, this is better for the technology. Like, we don't care. All we care about is leveraging uh, this in the court. Um, <laughs> right. And when people say, I, I think it's ridiculous that all these big companies are not involved, you know, they're not contributing back to open SSL and that's why there are bugs in it and so on. Um, I think one of the things that big companies like OBM do is they're hanging around so when a scope pops up, they can stand up against it in a way that the three of us can't. Right. But I think basically, unless you're in a situation like SCO where they only exist for legal reasons, suing doesn't work. Well, and I, I would build on that to a degree, and <clears throat> this is really hard because I think, first of all, you should try every non-legal option possible, right? So conversations trying to call in favors, um, you know, going out for dinner with the necessary people and trying to talk them around, like whatever it might be, the way business gets done is indirectly. And we've known that for years. Um, but I'd say in those situations, when you, you reach a dead end with that, and this is, this, this is like 18 year old version of me would hate me saying this but i think you just have to make an assessment between the benefits of the of the lawsuit and the disadvantages of of you know how much it will put off people like yes you may be able to get a company to give back contributions to 500 lines of gpl code but that then may put off other companies contributing thousands of lines of code or participating in the kernel whatever it might be and i think in some cases it's it, you know the risk of putting companies off the risk of of that is just isn't worth it like and yes that will mean that the gpl goes unenforced and to me i'm okay with that uh, but also saying that we have to defend it because if we don't defend it then it just becomes in, it, it, it stops being valuable right so i will say after reading that entire thread one. this is a much more nuanced topic than i thought it would be i, I thought i would go yes, in with yes. a little bit of a different opinion than i came out with <laughs> also makes yeah, me glad so, I am not a lawyer. Um, yeah. uh, it, ma- it makes me glad I'm not a diplomat because it yeah. must be really difficult. <laughs> I tell you what, makes me glad I'm not Linus Torvalds or Bradley Coon. Uh, <laughs> so, so, bad voltage community, go and tell us what you think. Get onto the forum. Uh, there's so much meat on this bone, uh, and I think you'll be re- like everybody's got really interesting perspectives on this. So, go and let us know what you think uh, at community.badvoltage.org. So, uh, sorry, Brian couldn't be here today. He is missed. Hopefully, he'll be back on the next show. He's yes, stuck fingers crossed. Tra- it's stuck in traffic, sadly, uh, which happens to the best of us. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting times going on with all this Google Plus bollocks. Uh, I'll be sad if it goes away, you know? I will. You know, it, it's basically the only place you can get a decent conversation. I find myself, you know, you, you can you can try on Twitter, but the, the constraints of the media mean that you just can't get into a decent conversation. Right. Um, oh, well, uh, we won't take that personally, will we, Jeremy? That's okay. You just can't, okay. man. Yeah, you it's all, you know, <laughs> wry, cynical asides or advertising. <laughs> right. <laughs> whereas, yeah. whereas if I want a decent conversation about something, I post on G+, because there isn't anywhere else. I mean, presumably I could get that on Facebook, but I'm not interested. Um, so if it goes away, what do you do? It's really annoying. Yes. Yeah. Well, we should. It's about that time when another social media network, a social network, should uh, should be popping up that we can all move to. Arise from the ashes of whatever the previous <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 honestly, for me, and I know that I'm, this is a sign of age, but like, I think enough is enough. Like, we don't need more social networks. I appreciate the fact that those companies want to do it, but it's like I don't have to go and set all that stuff up again, right? Yeah. You know, and add that to buffer. <laughs> it's like, it's um, just more crap being spewed out into the I, internet. I, I, I do think, which you brought up earlier, actually, that you are less part of the solution here and more part of the problem, Mister. I write all my tweets at the beginning of the week and then just pump them out everywhere. Yes, <laughs> I write that. I wrote those tweets for some of my tweets. I did self promotion <laughs> stuff. Uh, did you hear it by the way? That apparently I read somewhere. Oh, that was on Reddit last night. Actually, uh, uh, I was reading today. I learned apparently. Um, the number of bots online has now officially overtaken the number of people online. 
Uh, really? Which apparently sixty percent, sixty. I don't know how they figure this out, but sixty percent of traffic on the internet now apparently is bots, as opposed to human traffic. So wow. Um, hmm. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll just start seeing loads of like bot net uh, social networks forming out. You know, who that, knows? I if if they're claiming sixty percent of the traffic on the internet is bots, they've got a pretty loose definition of bot, in my opinion. But then right. everyone has a pretty loose definition of bot. I, I, I tend to think of them as chat bots. But a whole bunch of people would tell you that if you, you know, if you've got a program that connects to Amazon and looks for cheap deals, that's a bot. And I'm like, right. that's just a program. I'm because guessing that definition every even includes things like existence. buffer because it's not a person doing it. It's a right. bot doing yeah, it. Yeah, I bet. Probably I bet just you. any automated traffic. Right. But they are the thing. I mean... I, the thing, I, I did a talk about this. I'm doing the same talk again in a month or so. What I think is fascinating is not the technology of bots, which is dead easy, but the language analysis side of it. How do you make something which sounds convincingly human enough that people are prepared to have a conversation with it, but doesn't attempt to represent itself as human and fool people? You know, I mean, you don't want you don't want to tell people this is really this is really a human being, so you can fire all your humans and just have the bot because they're rubbish at it. Right, we're not going to pass a Turing test anytime soon. But equally, you want people to be comfortable expressing themselves in that kind of environment and not having to feel like they're typing things into a bash shell. And there's yeah. been there's been yeah. not that much work done on this. And to my mind, it's it's a user experience issue. And what's interesting is if you go, you talk to you, it, it, it lets you tell the difference between people who call themselves UX engineers and people who actually are UX engineers. Because you go to them and go, okay, we need a great user experience for this, but it's just text. And they're like, well, no, what I want to do is make it look pretty. And you're like, no, that's user interface, not user experience. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on. I just, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting to a point in my life where I just need to start, you know, decamping, yelling at the kids getting onto my lawn. Get away from here with your Snapchats. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe, you, maybe you need a digital detox. Ah, <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you what, right? I um, stuck a poll on Twitter about that on the Bad Voltage account, and a whole bunch of people were like, what are you talking about, you moron? Digital detox. <laughs> 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 yes. Not everybody. In our defence, but um, uh. it is starting to become apparent that um, a whole big swathe of people, uh, both who listen to the show and are out there on the internet, are now younger than us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that a thing? So keep yeah. listening to Bad Voltage, where you can see John O'Bacon slowly devolve into a Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> It's happening. It's actually, actually, it's not happening, to be fair. I love technology. It's brilliant. Uh, in fact, it's about time I reviewed something from five years ago on the show. I'll have to have a look around <laughs> to see what's Welcome lying to around. oldvoltage.com. <laughs> right. So I'm going to be reviewing a 486DX266 with the turbo button. With the turbo uh, button. Nice. You need the turbo button. Kind of missed that turbo uh, button. Yeah, yeah. I'm expecting any right, moment so- some kind of massive expose in the New York Times about how turbo buttons never did anything, like the closed buttons in lifts. yeah by the way just before we wrap up uh, i know this has got nothing to do with anything but i heard a term the other day that filled me with so much rage i just i I just i I need to vent right now okay so have you heard of this thing called glamping oh this is the posh camping thing oh my god that That is also from five years ago so yeah, it is. You just heard about it. I heard about it like two days ago, and it's just been. It keeps popping into my head. It just, oh, I just uh, irritates me. It's it's not at all clear to me that there were many actual glampers, as opposed to half a dozen who got a million newspaper articles about them. <laughs> I appear to be the only person who's not heard this word for, you know... It's like all these things, you know, breakfast cereal cafes in London and all that sort of thing. It's It what? gets blown up way... Be- you don't know about this? <laughs> like, no. posh hipster cafe, and you go there, and they just serve you, like, you know, Cheerios. <laughs> it's, oh, God. <laughs> and it's supposed to be the oh. trendy, cool place to go now. And pay £3.50 three for a bowl of, you know, shredded wheat or whatever. <laughs> With almond milk, Frosty. so. Frosties, That's but great. done in a kind of ironic, cool way. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And All on right. that bombshell, 
Yeah, let's. Yeah, I am gonna. I'm gonna go and. Yeah, eat a bowl of cereal a <laughs> in your posh tent. <laughs> I am actually. <laughs> I am actually quite hungry. I'm gonna get some cereal now. Right, go to community.badvoltage.org and tell us what you think, which cereal you're eating in your posh tent, and we'll see you in two weeks.